This is a part two of the righteousness of God. We're calling this a Bible basic because indeed uh, it is, and it's the first in a series of things that we're going to do uh, just to try to explain salvation in uh, uh, very simple terms. Uh, I must admit, sometimes that's difficult for me to do. We uh, have, have worked so hard to advance a doctrinal concepts uh, that it's hard to, um, to, to come back uh, to the milk. But um, we need both milk and meat. We need to understand in our uh, congregation there are lambs and there are sheep, uh, and uh, both need to be fed uh, uh, from time to time. We're talking about God's righteousness. And uh, one of the things I like about this is because people uh, think in terms of, of uh, God's righteousness uh, for themselves of bettering themselves. Oh, if I, if I could just be a better person, if I could just be a sweeter person, if I could just do more for humanity and, and so forth. Uh, and of course, perhaps there are some aspects of God's righteousness that, um, that are involved um, in our spiritual life in doing just those things. However, when it comes to salvation, God has a set way of thinking. And if you're going to be saved, you have to think just like he does. And we found out that the Greek word for righteousness means to think according to a fixed standard. Uh, and that's important because we have found that that standard is in God's essence or his being. The standard is his holiness, and he glories in that, uh, in the fact that he is so perfect and so right that he never does anything wrong. It's hard for me to relate to that, I'm sure uh, you as well. But um, think of it, when Jesus Christ came, he was sinlessly perfect. Uh, and he lived a life that was totally pleasing to the Father. He never sinned uh, in thought, word, or deed. Uh, and uh, of course, he reflects then this, uh, this uh, threefold uh, uh, point that we have with regard to the righteousness of God. From God's essence or his being, from his holiness, flows his thinking or his righteousness. And first and foremost, if you want to know what righteousness is, you have to relate it to God's thinking. What does he think about the matter? We call that here throne room viewpoint. Uh, what does God, uh, in fact, think regarding this issue and that issue? Now, what we're talking about here, though, is divine thinking with regard to salvation. In order for a person to be saved, we contend you've got to think exactly like God. If you don't, you're unsaved. And that unrighteousness isn't, oh, well, they're bad, they're bad. they took dope, they, they drank, you know, they caroused, you know. That, that's part of being unrighteous in a sense. But unrighteousness truly is refusing to think like God. That's what unrighteousness is. Well, what, what is righteousness? Thinking like God. And when it comes down to his son, there's only one way that God thinks. And uh, he's not going to budge on it for you or for me. And that is his son paid sins dead in full on the cross. And that what's left for us to do is believe that and appropriate it on, on our behalf because we are unrighteous. And we have been unrighteous in our thinking until that point. All right. So unrighteousness is wrong. It, it in effect gets us divine cursing or his justice. But the justice of God is free to then bless us if we correctly think like God. So we have found a principle. Holiness demands righteousness. Whatever righteousness demands, justice must execute. Otherwise, it wouldn't be just or right. Uh, whatever righteousness condemns, that is, unrighteous thinking regarding Christ. It is Christ plus baptism. Christ plus communion. Christ plus good works. Christ plus confirmation. Christ plus this. Christ plus my good works and what have you. No, it is Christ alone. That is God's thinking. And if you begin adding or subtracting from the cross work, you are not saved. And in fact, you can stamp it right across your forehead. Unrighteous, I think differently than God. And you are unsaved. I grant, I'll tell you the truth. Look, you're right in the eye and tell you, you're unsaved. Why? Because you don't think like God. And so therefore, justice 
wanting to do what's right, reflecting God's righteousness, must curse you. Uh, you are called lost and undone. You're called a, a heathen. You're called an unbeliever. Uh, you're called worse things than that, but for the dignity of the clergy, I'll not reflect those in my, my study. Fear the tape and somebody will sue me. He called me this. Well, it's true. And I'm that too. But there, comes a, there came a time in my life when somebody told me I was a sinner, couldn't save myself, and that I needed to simply believe on Christ, and I did that. And that got for me the righteousness of God imputed to my uh, account. Do you know I'm righteous? Why? Because I did something good? No, because I thought like God. Now, that's, that's good in and of itself, but it's non-meritorious. It wasn't something that, for me, made God say, well, now, look at that guy. He's really a good guy. Uh -uh. He took, God looked, and this guy took what Christ did for him on the cross. So, Righteousness commends, uh, whatever it commends, justice will bless by way of salvation. All right, then we looked at, and this is where we left off, that there is a standard. And that standard is from zero to 100%. When it comes to God's righteousness and man's righteousness, how much righteousness does man have in and of himself apart from God? Do you want to go through all of the zip, nada? <laughs> uh, I mean, we have a long list of, uh, of uh, night. Uh, uh, I think that's, uh, well, anyway, all of those uh, things where it reflects none. How much righteousness does God have without man? 100%. And there's the conflict. He is righteous in his thinking. We are unrighteous in our thinking. And so, in order to have a relationship, we must think like him. And that, that's, that's bottom line. But now, here's where we left off. The problem is that people think that they have got to work for it. We're in Romans chapter 9 and verse number 30. It says the Gentiles that followed not after righteousness, self-righteousness you could, you could put there, have attained to divine righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. Israel followed after the law of self-righteousness, but did not attain to the law of divine righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were the works of the law. And Paul calls this the law of righteousness. Self-righteousness, man's righteousness that, that uh, is, um, is acquired by his good deeds, by his works, is totally eliminated from this picture. Uh, they were self-righteous to the core. They did every, their whole nation, it was a theocracy. From the political aspect to the spiritual aspect, everything was dictated by God. But one thing they left out, that salvation is from faith to faith, uh, the just shall live by faith. And they did not believe in the message God gave regarding his son. Therefore, the law of righteousness takes over and voids all of man's self-righteous efforts for salvation. It's no good. It does not work. Uh, come with me to chapter 10, verse 3. Here's why Israel failed in their works. Here's why you should not fail. Here's why you should not leave this building this morning unsaved or unrighteous. They being ignorant of God's righteousness, and willfully so. God told them and told them, and they rejected it. They went about to establish their own righteousness. And that word establish there means, histomy in the Greek, means to set against a standard. That's why we have this standard here to set against the standard. So here's a man who thinks, oh, he's so good. And he comes up to this standard and God says, all right, uh, take, take your thumb off the scale. <laughs> you know, uh, don't, don't cheat. How much righteousness do you have? And we're all amazed. Why? Because we don't have any. And Israel's going to be amazed because they, they obeyed the word of God as much as they could in law keeping for their salvation but they didn't have faith. And the one way to get divine righteousness, the only way, is faith. And faith means embracing the thinking of God regarding his son, Jesus Christ. They went about to establish their own righteousness. And here's their second error. They have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. That word hupotasso means 
to be obedient to a requirement of an authority. Now, if you're in the army, if you're a coach, if you're a student in a classroom, uh, there are power people, the, the teacher, the sergeant, uh, um, and so forth. And do you know in order to get along with your teacher or your sergeant or your parents and so forth, if they are right and legitimate, do you know to get along with these people, you know what you have to do? Think like them. That's right. You have to think like them. You, you know, uh, you have no problem with them if you just think like them. If they've given a legitimate instruction, um, you become unrighteous if you take it and twist it and distort it or don't obey it and don't adhere to it and disrespect it. If you want to get along with them and they're in authority and they're in the right and they've given a command, what do you have to do? Think like them, period. Now, it's the very same thing with, with uh, God regarding Jesus Christ. If you'll uh, hold your place here, let's come to the front of the book of Romans, chapter 1. Faith is an act of obedience. And it's called the law of faith. And we'll see this in a minute. Verse number 5. By whom, says Paul, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. You see, God has said something specifically regarding his son in this dispensation. That's what you have to believe to be saved. It's incorporated in what's called the mystery doctrine that was given uh, to Paul. Uh, there is prophecy pertaining to Israel. There's mystery pertaining to this dispensation and the church. But incorporated in that mystery was faith alone in Christ alone by grace alone for our salvation. And so that's what you obey today for, for um, eternal life. Holding your place again in Romans chapter 10, go back to chapter 16. Okay, and it says, verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the mystery. Verse 26, But now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for what? The obedience of faith. Uh, not works, uh, not a little bit of works, a little bit of faith. Not half works and half faith. What have you? Any type of admixture negates either one of them. It either has to be faith or works. It cannot be both. And so therefore, uh, here is what we obey for salvation. Believe in Christ and we're saved. Come back to chapter 10 again in Romans. The last part of verse 3. The reason they failed is they were willingly ignorant of God's righteousness and went about to establish their own. Set it against a standard, and they came up short. They have no righteousness. They didn't submit themselves to the righteousness of God. They wouldn't obey what God said. They wouldn't think like Him. For, says the Apostle Paul, Christ is the end of the law. It's no more condemnation. The law cannot send you to hell rightly. For Christ is the end of the law for what? Righteousness to everyone that believes. And uh, this is what he is going to call the law of faith as we move back in Romans to chapter 3. Okay, Romans chapter 3. And uh, we'll look at, at verse number, where am I here? Verse number 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, if you work for it, you can boast about it. Well, Lord, look how many points I earned. 
Uh, look how many badges uh, I have. I know I, I went to a church uh, one time when I was uh, little and they gave badges, you know, and so forth. And I had them at least the first few years down to my toes because I was only that high. Uh, but um, uh, but it was, uh, no one ever told me about salvation. Uh, and you mainly went there and you sang a, a couple of songs and recited the Lord's Prayer and you did this, some of these various things. And that was it. Uh, then once I grew up, you know, and it just never came back because it was meaningless. It was ritual without reality. Uh, and sometimes the ritual was beautiful and they would have these, you know, glistening communion services and, and the candles and the rest of it. But it was meaningless because no one ever told me I was a sinner and needed a savior. That's when at age 19, when somebody told me that and I did it, that's when I was saved. Religion does not save. And uh, never has, never will. By what law works? No. But by, and here's our next phrase, the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith and without the deeds of the law. And so we have on one side the law of faith that gets for us God's righteousness and the law of righteousness, which requires that if we're going to have a relationship, it must be the same as God's. If you're trusting in your own righteousness, you're lost and undone and headed for hell. Okay, let's go back to the book of Isaiah now. Book of Isaiah. Chapter 64. Some reason I, I can't find this in our outline, and I hope that I did not leave it out. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse number 6. I can't find it here in our outline, but it is a, a key, key verse. Oh, well. Must have been one of them, their senior moments. Really, again, I say it's not a senior moment. It's that, it's that I'm, no, I'm, I'm doing too much. Uh, I'm going to have to do something here by way of, uh, of, of getting out of some responsibilities. For example, Tuesday and, I mean, Monday and Tuesday, I'm back up to Bible Doctrines for another board meeting. And I'm going to have to just explain to uh, Brother Lee that it's either going to be our evangelism conference or the board meeting or... I'm not going to be able to attend them all or something like this because it's just, I'm, I'm going thither and yon, to and fro, and uh, I end up not matching my socks and then I get in trouble. So, uh, well, I don't know where the other one went. <laughs> so you just... Anyway, yeah, Sarah. Verse number six. Now, what I'm, I'm going to do here um, uh, publicly makes me um, somewhat uncomfortable, uh, simply because you don't talk about this openly and the like, especially what I've, I've, I've done here. And uh, by the way, uh, we've got it spelled right on, um, on, the, uh, uh, on the overhead, but of all things to draw attention to on the on the outline I misspelled it and I don't know why I didn't catch it in spell check uh, but um, it has a uh, menstrual has a, a U in it anyway what I've done is confronted us with something and the reason that I've done that is not to be undignified not to be unkind but to do for us, visually, what God does in His Word. He confronts us with, with the fact of a menstrual cloth. Now, mind you, a menstrual cloth, before it was used, was not contaminated. You could touch a menstrual cloth and go, go right to the temple and, and sacrifice. And you, there was no contamination. You weren't put out uh, of, of the camp for seven days and so forth. Um, you could do this and there's nothing wrong. And uh, on the other side of it, there's nothing wrong with man's soul. 
There was absolutely nothing wrong with man's soul as it came from the, from the hand of his creator. Nothing whatsoever is wrong. But the reason that I drew this is because there is a physical spiritual analogy here that you need to understand if you're going to understand righteousness and unrighteousness. Nothing wrong with the menstrual cloth, nothing wrong with man's soul. But when the bad blood hits the menstrual cloth, what happens to that cloth? It is defiled. And the person that is bleeding and anything or anybody, as we'll see, that comes in contact with that person becomes unclean and they better not approach the temple. And of course, the blood, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And nothing uh, more in Scripture reflects the curse on mankind and his life than the blood that comes from the menstrual cycle of the woman. You know, the... The, the tree of life has 12 manner of fruit, one every month, one every month. You have a discarding of every pollutant that is involved with man in the menstrual cycle of the woman. And that, of course, uh, uh, it, uh, makes the, the way for uh, conception later on with, uh, with the egg and, and the like. But the curse on the woman and uh, the menstrual cycle uh, emphasizes... Um, the pollution that came from Adam and Eve. Now, what did Adam and Eve do that uh, made God liken our righteousness to these menstrual cloths? Look at verse number six. For we are all as an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We do all fade as a leaf. It's an unclean thing refers to our being. Our righteousness refers to our thinking, and fading as a leaf, what is produced or our doing. But we're going to um, stay here on the middle one. Egg beged, claw stained with blood from a woman's menstrual cycle. Now, let's turn back from this point to the Leviticus chapter 15. Leviticus chapter 15. Now, as you found your place there in Leviticus chapter 15, we'll start with uh, verse number 19 here in a, a moment. But why draw this? this way. Uh, we were probably in some other churches. We would probably have some of the little old ladies uh, going out mad at the preacher. You can be mad at me all you want to because you don't believe the Bible. And I want to tell you the physical spiritual analogy, an analogy here will devastate you if you think you're self-righteous. The cloth is not, is not bad. The cloth can be clean. You did not take a, and excuse the phrase, a used menstrual cloth and, uh, and so forth and put it on. You took a clean cloth. But once the blood hit the cloth, that cloth was defiled and it defiled everything around it. Now, that blood on that clean cloth is likened to self-righteousness in your soul. You think contrary to God, you are just as defiled and putrid as undignified as that blood on that cloth. But that's, that's, that's what it is. And if that doesn't hammer home your own worthlessness before the cross, nothing will. You are unrighteous to the core. Yeah, but pastor, I've done, I don't care. It's like that blood. That when a blood hits the cloth, it's defiled. And when an unrighteous thought hits your brain, you are defiled. It defiles your whole soul. It's permeated you to the core. You're unrighteous. You're ungodly. And that's your standing before God. Hard hitting, but that's what God does. Now, so Leviticus chapter 15. What does a person do who has this bad blood? If a woman has an issue, and the issue in her flesh be blood, she'll be put apart seven days. A complete separation. Seven is the number of completion or perfection. A perfect separation for her. And she shall be put apart seven days. And whosoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything that she uh, uh, lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. 
Everything that she sits upon shall be unclean. Whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes, bathe himself, and shall be unclean. Whosoever touches anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes, and shall bathe himself in water, and be unclean. If it be on her bed uh, where she sits, when he touches it, he shall be unclean. If a man lies uh, with her at all in her flowers, uh, we studied that before, what that is, uh, he shall be unclean to evening and, and, and so forth. Complete separation. Everything the blood touched, unclean. Anybody who touched where the blood touched was unclean. So now how does that translate to you and to me? You're in a church service that doesn't teach the truth of the word of God with regard to salvation. That's the issue that we're on. They teach some other way of salvation or some mixture of faith and works. It hits your brain and you're defiled. You not only defile yourself, but if everybody else believes the same thing with you, they are unclean. Your church is unclean. Where you go to work is unclean. Your family is unclean. But pastor, we're a good family. We're, I'm not talking about that. Because true righteousness is not your goodness at all. It is thinking like God about Jesus Christ. And it is unrighteous thinking that makes you defiled. And just as that blood defiles that clean cloth, unrighteous thinking defiles your soul. And just like that blood makes everything in the periphery of that person unclean. Anyone who contacts it, your unrighteous thinking makes you and your family and anybody else who thinks that way unclean. And those are, that's about as hard hitting and as devastating that, that I can make it, but that's what the Bible teaches. You're unclean because you are self-righteous. And anybody who's self-righteous is not going to make it. Okay, let's, let's move on here. As the bad blood defiles the cloth, self-righteousness defiles the soul. So let's go back to Romans. We call these the four Catholic nuns, but I, I just put universal nuns here in Romans. Romans chapter 3. Man is universally condemned. Why? Because of his unrighteousness. Because of his refusal to think like God and his inserting his own thinking into the salvation process. Well, if God is so hotsy totsy good, he's so holy, I'll just make myself holy, and he'll have to recognize me. And that is, that is not true. Um, uh, the only way that God is going to make you holy and right is by your thinking like him. That's why Paul, in, with, in these uh, uh, verses, four times uses the word none. He says, there is none righteous no, not one. Verse number 10. We mentioned that all humanity by Paul is lumped into one group without exception. Nobody is righteous. Now, because you are not righteous, it's going to affect something else. If you do not think right, what's the next thing that it affects? Your understanding. Note what he said. Therefore, based on that, there is none that understands. You don't understand the issue. Self-righteousness doesn't cut it, and you're trying to be self-righteous, offering all these good works. When, when God the Father says, hey, I'm not looking at your good works because I don't think they're righteous at all. You're defiled. What I'm looking at is the work of my son on the cross. Now, him I respect. Now, him I like. What he did uh, is compatible with my essence. So, if you don't think like God, and none do in and of yourself, therefore you do not understand. So, um, if you're a, a member of this church or any others, and you think it's some, some sort of works program that saves you, you lack comprehension to be saved. You lack an understanding. And that's what Paul is saying here. Not only do you not think right, you're none righteous, but now you don't understand. It takes more uh, than your good works and efforts to save you. So then he goes over and it says, verse number uh, 11, there is none 
that seeketh after God or God's way. Hold your place here. Come back with me to the book of Romans 9. Verse 31 again. Why were the majority of Israelites lost? Israel followed after the law of self-righteousness, verse 31, but did not attain to the law of divine righteousness. Why? They sought it. Nobody seeks God or his way, his way of doing things. Um, we are so stubborn. We are so ornery. When it comes to the, our way of thinking, I'm not going to think like God. No, God, you're going to think like me. You're going to think that I'm good enough to get into heaven without Jesus Christ and his righteousness given on my behalf. Let me tell you, that is the height of human arrogance. But that's why Paul says, none think like God, therefore, uh, people have a fuzzy understanding, therefore, nobody seeks God. They sought it not by faith. Verse 3 of chapter 10, they went about to establish their own righteousness. But, as far as God's concerned, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. All right, come back to the last one here. Chapter 3 again in Romans. They are all gone out of the way. Well, like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The way is God's singular way of thinking regarding salvation. And sheep are going their own way because they refuse to think like the shepherd. Last part of verse 12. And I like this because it's a fitting conclusion. There is none that doeth good. See, we've got a bunch of good doers on this planet. Six billion people, many of which are associated with some sort of religion. Bunch of do-gooders. And God says, not only none righteous, no, not one, but there's none that, that does good, no, not one. You can't do good as far as God's way of thinking unless you think like God. Since you don't, you don't do good in actuality. But, but, Pastor, you just don't understand how much I contributed to, to a soup kitchen, to a rescue mission. Uh, how good I've been and I've clothed these people and, and, and I've worked this hard. I've built homes and I've helped my neighbor and so forth. Okay, fine, well and good. Do you hear the violins? Uh, because I sure do. You don't get it, do you? Those things are not good as far as God is concerned when it comes to salvation. And you say, well, no, surely there's an exception. And he puts the same three words on the back of the word good here as he did righteous. None righteous, no, not one, no exceptions. None that doeth good, no, not one, no exceptions. The only people who ever do good start off by doing good by thinking like God. That's where it starts to be good. And only when you think like him are you going to uh, be saved. All right, that brings us then to our uh, last uh, portion here. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Now here is the, the second typo. Uh, I'm not perfect, but I am a perfectionist. So rather than you're telling me about it, I've already found them. Believe you me, I'll kick myself harder than you could ever kick me. Uh, God's righteousness is twice declared in this portion, and we're going to tie this all together, hopefully. And if there's somebody here that has never trusted Christ, you realize this morning you're unrighteous. That's what unrighteousness is. And hopefully you'll come to know him whom to know right is life eternal. Now, the typo is in our diagram six. It says actually unto all. It should be upon all believers. I don't know how I missed that. But verse number 22, Romans 3, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all. Now you'll note, 
I have in our little box, potential. If you're here this morning and you have never believed exactly the way that I have related the scripture demands for you to believe to be saved, it's still potential. As long as there's breath in your lungs and the light bulbs on in your brain, it remains potential. The offer is to you uh, to, to trust Jesus Christ as your savior. And just as there are no exceptions or exclusions to being righteous and good, there are no exceptions to this. You're not too bad to be saved. Potentially, God offers his righteousness to all. If you're a sinner, you qualify. Uh, and uh, if you are not a sinner, um, you don't understand. Uh, we'll, we'll, need to, we'll need to sit down here and talk just a little bit more. But potentially, it's offered to you, anyone. But it is only given to those who believe. Note the last part of the verse. It's offered unto all, but given upon all. Them that believe, for there's no difference. If you're a sinner, doesn't matter who you are, what you are, potentially you can be saved. If you're a, you're a person who has believed on Christ, doesn't matter who you are or what you are, you will be saved and given the righteousness of God. Now, why is this declared? Verse number 25, the first declaration. God has set forth through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. And the word declare there means to manifest something through an act. God is going to manifest his righteousness through an act. And that act is the remission of sins. You might try to make up for it. You might say to God, I'm sorry. You might, you know, give up something for Lent. You might try to do all of these religious works to pay for your sins. And let me tell you, your sacrifices, your sufferings, and your sorrows will never pay for one little bit of your sins. Now, you can apologize to a person and they can forgive you, but don't you ever say, well, I'm sorry, God. My sorrow is going to net your forgiveness. Let me tell you, it's by his stripes we are healed and only his stripes. It's by his suffering. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It is not what we, we do to pay for our sins. But hey, there's good news. Jesus Christ already paid for them. And if you'll simply believe uh, uh, like God, he's declaring his righteousness in an act on your behalf. Your sins are remitted. Hey, you, <laughs> you know what remittance is. You've got a bank account. Uh, you're, they're gone. There, you know, the debt is forgiven of God, not based on what you have done, but what he has done for you. Your sins are gone. They're absolutely forgiven. You don't owe God any sin debt because Jesus Christ, excuse the phrase, picked up the tab. That's one good thing. Uh, you know, when we went up to a prayer and planning uh, 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 party, a uh, party. <laughs> planning uh what was it? What did we do? We planned. When I was thinking the Bible doctrines paid for a tab, and I said I've known Lee for uh, 25 years now, and I told all the folks there was it was uh, I really felt blessed because this is the third time in all in all those years that he picked up the tab for. <laughs> you no, know, he's come through here so so many times that. Uh, Diana and I uh, took him as a deduction on our taxes. <laughs> you know, then I'm coming north, then I'm coming south, then I'm coming. Okay, well, anyway, the point here is the remission of sins. Somebody else picked up the tab for you. You try to pick up the tab in this regard to pay for it yourself and, uh, you're going to end up being punished rather than praised. Last declaration here, verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believes on, on Jesus. You see, the only way God can be just and in effect keep his integrity is by giving you his righteousness what do, uh, that does not threaten his own holiness. His righteousness comes by one way, 
and that's simply by faith. We're in chapter 4. We're almost done. Let's use the example of, of Abraham. Now, just as a sidelight here, uh, our friend Bob Hill has written a book, and in it he contends that Old Testament saints had no security. Okay? Now, he makes some, some pretty good points that Bob's a smart cookie, but um, uh, I wonder. The reason I wonder is, what about Abraham? Is he an Old Testament saint? If he didn't have security, what did he have? If he didn't have righteousness and eternal life, then in what sense was it right, in what sense was it eternal? And so uh, I think to myself along the uh, myself, <laughs> think to myself along these lines. What shall we then say about Abraham, our father, pertaining to the flesh? What did he find? If he were justified by works, he could glory, but not before God. See, that's what works do. God, I'm righteous. God, you must recognize me. But what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for divine righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward reckoned not of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for divine righteousness. That's the whole point. If you want to exchange your self-righteousness worthlessness, works program for something that is going to be effective to save you, it's one thing you must do. Have faith. Believe what God says regarding Christ and your thinking is now righteous thinking and that God imputes it to your account. God thinks that way. Guess who else now thinks that way about Jesus Christ? You do. You have run that thought across the gray matter there and you said, well, you know, I believe that. And the moment you do, God says, you're a righteous person. So, God has twice declared it because he wants you to be saved. 